let me introduce Inbar, who's um, one of our key uh, people at Checkpoint. Um, he's been teaching and lecturing about internet and um, reverse engineering for almost as, as long as he's been on the planet. He actually, I'm um, told, he started programming at the age of, uh, of nine years old, right, Dimba, and uh, on something called a Dragon 64, so many of you wouldn't be, uh, be familiar with that. At the age of 13, he got a PC and started reverse engineering that, and at the age of 14, he was in high school and a key member in the uh, bulletin board scene, scene in Israel. Um, he has spent most of his career in internet security, and uh, uh, he's, uh, fortunately, he's not behind bars because he chose the right side of the, uh, of the law. Um, seriously though, uh, Inbar runs a, uh, uh, not many of you would know that uh, of the 3,000 people at Checkpoint, 150 of them are threat researchers. Uh, Inbar leads a key team on the, uh, on the malware threat research team. He's been in Australia for a few weeks uh, doing a bit of a circuit and I'm really pleased that uh, uh, he's been able to, uh, uh, you know, look at our situation here and I think he's got some very salient advice for us, not all, all just about IT security but also on the physical side as well. So uh, let's introduce uh, Inbar Raz. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Can you guys hear me okay? OK. So it says there malware and security research. So malware research, you all know what it is. Security research, or at least in this part, is vulnerability research. What we do is, uh, and mind you, this is a non-revenue generating business. It was, uh, I'm a groundbreaking employee at Checkpoint. And uh, we are actually taking care of the public. We look for vulnerabilities that could lead to a compromise of public data, uh, just the normal people, the mom and pop, and we report that. As you might know, the, the, the industry does not penalize you if you create uh, a damaged product, right? Because if you buy a car and you go to the shop every other month, you will never buy that car again. But guess what? The most important piece of software on your computer, the operating system, is riddled with security holes. And every single month, there's another patch, and another patch, and another patch, right? And most people just stay with the same thing. They've accepted that. So the only way to fix the world is to twist the arm of the vendors, because a programmer that is fixing yesterday's bug is not creating tomorrow's bug. And the way to do that is by what we call the responsible disclosure. We go to the vendor. We tell them, look, you have a problem. And it's risking people's data. And I'm not selling anything. I'm not going to sell you a service. I'm not going to sell you a product. I'm going to tell you where the vulnerability is, and it's your job to fix it because it's your code. I can't help you with that. And based on the complexity of the problem, you will have time to deal with that before I go public. But I will go public. And this is a, a good incentive for the vendors to fix it. Now, based on the complexity of fixing the problem and issuing and deploying the patch, that's how long the vendor gets. And after we do that, then we go to full disclosure, which is when we talk to the public and we show them that. So the public can make an informed decision on the product and services that they want to use. Right? Now, I'm going to give a few examples. And in my experience, when you give sophisticated examples, such as uh, the Chinese hacking into RSA, stealing keys, and then using those keys to hack into Lockheed Martin and steal the plans for the F-35, this is too much. This, go, this goes over people's heads. Managers, they don't speak the language. They don't understand that. They think it's not going to happen to them. They think they don't have an F-35, so they're not on the target list. They don't care. So I'm going to uh, give you some examples that are so simple that, in fact, not only is every single one of you going to look at the world in a different way, because you can ask all the Checkpoint guys that have seen that uh, presentation, uh, especially this guy here who keeps sending me photos from all kinds of places. It'll change the way you look at the world, and uh, you will be able to pull off such stunts yourselves. Now, it's not for nothing the court said that I'm not in jail. Do not do that, OK? You need consent, or so my lawyers tell me. So the first example, uh, who's gone to the cinema recently? Guys, get a life. Come on. <laughs> Today, when you go to the cinema, you don't buy the ticket there. You buy it on the internet. You go to the cinema, and there's this little device there, and it'll uh, pretty much just print a ticket, right? If you want, you can show up early and pick your seat. So it has a touch screen, a credit card reader. Remember that, by the way, because this will always attract my attention, and a, a ticket printer, and pretty much that's it. It's a hard, hardened device. So theoretically, there's very little malicious things 
there are very few things that you can do with that, or so you'd think. This is an example in Israel. Now ignore the Hebrew, that is not important. What's important is that bad configuration left a menu accessible to the general public. And of all the menu options here, this means open application, close application, open execute, exit to operating system, print settings, and just exit. The only one that they did not disable was the one that they thought was the least dangerous, which is the print settings. When you open that one, you get this little dialog that lets you, uh, you know, do the print settings. We've all done that before. And it also lets you, for some reason, there's this little network button there. It lets you look for additional printers. There's no reason you should be allowed to do that. And when you do that, you get a Windows Explorer on the touch screen. Now, this is a restricted window. It will only let you look for printers. So there's not a lot you can do with that. However, they went a long way, and the touch screen is actually fully compatible with human interface device. So if you press your finger and hold it for two seconds, that's a right click. And when you right click a directory name, it lets you open it in a new window. And the new window is no longer restricted. This is a full-fledged Windows Explorer. You can just go anywhere you want and look at everything. Now, if you can look at the bottom of the screen, I don't know if you can see that, there's the local disk C, and there's an open network share, right? So there was no one behind me in line yet. So I said, all right, let's uh, go. And it's not long before I encounter directory names with interesting names, such as credit, right? Inside credit, you find a long list of files called tran and then b in a number. Anybody wants to guess what tran stands for? because English is my second language, so it's hard for me. So I use one of the sophisticated hacking tools at my disposal, Notepad, and it ends up that I have unencrypted text files containing credit card numbers, okay? 4580, Israeli Visa, 5326, Israeli MasterCard. Now, I wanna make something straight. This is not illegal, okay? Maybe they're assholes, pardon my French, but this is not illegal. Maybe it's breaking PCI, but it's not illegal. Now, since I play the black hat, I am the white hat, but I play the black hat. My target, my objective here is to take as much of that information away with me and then just write these numbers on cards because as I discovered in Australia, you don't even need a pin code for transactions under $100. All you need to know is that number there, the expiration date and all the stuff on the magnetic stripe. So obviously I can take a photo, right? This was taken with a little point and shoot camera. But the problem with that, well, there are two problems. First of all, it's a limited bandwidth. Look at how much information I have there, and that's just one file. So I have to take the photo and then go home and then pay someone, probably in India or China, to type it. And then that's not a lot. It's just not a lot. However, taking a photo also attracts attention. The reason I know that, because as I was taking that photo, I had the cinema manager come up to me and say, well, excuse me, sir, can I help you? So I just looked back at him and said, no, nah, that's okay, there's a security problem here and I'm working on it, which was true. <laughs> so he thinks for a moment and then he looks at me and says, well, thanks for coming, there's also a problem with the printer. <laughs> so as far as this guy was concerned, I was working for the company. This is called social engineering. I was giving him two little pieces of the puzzle, and he completed the rest. Now, if I had told him that the device was malfunctioning and needed a replacement, he would have helped me carry to my car. <laughs> but what else do I have at my disposal? A printer. So all I have to do is print this and then go home. Now, a little anecdote, when I did that for the first time, I forgot that by default, Notepad does not do line wrapping. So I ended up with two meters of credit cards. But because by then my cover story had been established, that was okay. But it gets worse. Can you guys see what it says there? Begin RSA private key. Begin RSA certificate. This should not be there at all. So all you have to do is print it, scan it, and then use a free off-the-shelf OCR. Of course, this is a movie ticket, so there's the terror line, so you get a few letters screwed up. Every line, you have to manually fix that, but there you go. And Masav, that's the Israeli credit billing service. So now not only can I steal your credit card number, I can actually bill you. And then you have to explain to your uh, spouse 
what exactly was the type of the movie you saw for $100? So let's sum the first example, sum it up. The purpose of the device was to print movie tickets. That's it. What we got from it was query card numbers and encryption keys. Now, what sophisticated hacking tool did I use to pull this off? My finger. And even I have five of those. <laughs> All right? Moving on. Point of sale devices. The, these guys are all over the news now. It all started with the target breach. Ever since then, it's all over the news. Now, a comment. A good malware will take three to nine months to discover, and then three to six more to investigate. When you read about it, this is last year's news. Remember that. And when you read about the target breach, it's not because someone at Target found a malware. It's because the credit card numbers have been surfacing up in the black market. So they could have been collecting for a while, OK? Just remember that. Now, I know that in the name of being politically correct, you call waiters in Australia servers, right? You know that. But they don't need the IP address of the point of sale device. And for me as an attacker, this is valuable information. And another thing, which I learned in Australia, I was backpacking here six years ago. Apparently, there's a drinking problem in Australia, or so they say. And you're not allowed to serve alcohol without going through proper training. That is called responsible service of alcohol. Did any of you guys ever do that when they were younger? OK, there you go. And you get a certificate. And if you can't show that certificate, you won't get a job. So in my head, it all comes together. And it turns out that if you're a bartender in Australia, you're actually a server with an RSA certificate. How cool is that? <laughs> this is a restaurant in Tel Aviv. We have good weather, slightly better than Melbourne, no offense. And we have designated parts of the sidewalk for tables and chairs. And of course, a point of sale device, because this significantly increases the speed of the service. At the end of the day, everything is hauled back inside, and they lock the door. But there's one thing they leave outside. Who cares to guess? All right. Now, why is that? Because they are not in the business of IT security. They are in the business of serving you coffee, or cake, or both. So all you have to do is show up with a computer, connect to the port, and listen to the network. I'm an attacker. I want to gather intelligence. I don't, want, I don't know how many opportunities I'm going to get at my target, so I want to collect as much information as possible so when I come there, I'm well equipped with all the right tools. This is a screenshot of uh, Wireshark, which is a traffic analysis software. And you can see IP addresses. So I can tell who's on the network, who's talking, who's listening, what protocols they're using. This is an in, uh, intelligence collection. I found five responding or living servers, and I move on to the next stage. Evidence of SMB, which is the file sharing protocol everybody uses on Windows and Linux and OS X, leads me to just try that. This is a screenshot from OS X. This is for Mac people. If you guys use Windows, you just open the Explorer and uh, type backslash, backslash, and then the IP address. That's it. This is the protocol. And of course, the answer you will get is, are you a guest or a registered user? So far, so good. This is protocol. I said I was a guest because I'm an honest guy and because I wanted to see what happens. I was expecting to get nothing in return. What I did get, however, is full access to both volumes on the point of sale device. Now, what can you do with a full access open share on a point of sale device? Look around, establish attack vectors. Look at these files, database files as big as 93 megabytes. Now, I don't know what's in them. Why? Because I'm connected to somebody else's network. I don't want to take any information out. That makes me responsible for that information. That makes me create an additional risk that did not exist before. Remember, I just play the bad guy, but I'm the good guy. So I don't want to do that. But imagine, this can be transaction records. It can be customer records. It can be supplier records. It can be your planned uh, price plan. If I'm your competition, I can take you out of business, and you will never know what hit you. Because nothing is going to be, sh you won't have any record of that. And admin MDB, interesting. And, oh, what's that? Tran B001. They're using the same billing engine. And guess what? Unencrypted credit card number text files. 
Now, unlike before when I needed to print that and even then I had one file, I'm connected to the network. I can copy the whole thing in five seconds and have every single credit card ever used in each one of the uh, point of sale devices. Imagine that, five seconds. And then I create a file list. Typically I would copy the whole thing, but like I said, I don't wanna do that. And I will go home, analyze. Just by looking at the file list, I can determine install software, which versions. By that I can deduce which vulnerabilities you have, right? This is very valuable information. And then I get to this IP address, which is alive on the system, but it does not offer file sharing. So my first guess is the ADSL modem. Most of these places are small businesses. They're about, I'd say, one quarter of this room, the whole establishment with the kitchen and the stuff you don't see. And they all use either ADSL or cable modems to uh, run their business. So I try to access the web UI. They all have a web UI, and I get this in return, which is kind of weird because if you look at the text, it is HTML, and it is exactly what this page is supposed to look like. However, I got it as a text file, so I just look at the text file, read the URLs, and just pick one, the one that I suspect has the interesting information in it. And when I go there, I get this. I made it to the printer. This is the printer where they print the bill, orders to the kitchen, and so on. Now, as an, attack, as an attacker, there's very little I can do with that, right? Maybe I can leave an obscene message or something if I want, but that's not useful. However, sorry, this little piece of information is a new piece of the puzzle. I now know for a fact the IP of the gateway. As an attacker, I collect information and I paint the whole picture. And actually, it turns out we already had that information. If we look back at the screenshot by Wireshark, this line says a device by D-Link is our broadcasting and saying that it's at 0 0.254. Now, if you guys know your products, then D-Link, they make communication stuff, right? Switches, routers, modems. So that could have been a good guess. And of course, for an attacker, there's nothing better than a piece of information corroborated by two sources. So I go there, and naturally, it has access control. Anyone wants to guess? Admin, admin, and I get this. Now you could ask yourself, so what's the big deal? So you got access to their modem. Well, there are two very dangerous things that I can do right now. The first one, the most obvious one, is to click the menu item that says enable remote administration. And this means that I can go home, connect from the internet, since I already have the credentials, and immediately I get an IP address in the internal network. And you've just seen what I can do with that, right? So I can keep milking their point of sale devices for eternity. But the problem with that is that it's a menu item. And maybe the admin will come a week from now, just, you know, gets bored, browse through the menu and say, whoa, who clicked that? And then unclick it, and then I'm out. So I have a problem. I want to think persistency. I'm a good attacker. So here's an honest question. Which one of you knows by heart the IP address of their DNS? And notice that I'm not raising my hand because I don't. Anyone? Okay, a couple of hands. That's reality, no one does. So if I change the DNS server here, they would never know. And that will be DNS hijacking which will allow me to route their entire traffic through my servers. They will never find it out, never. So that's a lot worse. So, summing this up, the purpose of the device was a cash register and a local server. What well, we ended up getting, credit card data, customer database. What sophisticated hacking tools did we use? Off-the-shelf MacBook Pro and a free software. And if you don't like Mac, use a PC. Just as good, okay? Now, it turns out that the unattended wall port problem is a lot more common than you would think. This is a medical clinic in Tel Aviv where I go when, I don't, when I'm not feeling well. Attendance clocks are always at eye level in front of your face, as is the internet connection or the intranet connection. So all you have to do is disconnect this and connect your laptop. And you know what? There's a free port here. Maybe I can use that one. But we've already learned that it attracts attention. So maybe that's not a good idea. So 
not to pretend to be Steve Jobs or something. Who's familiar with this little device, TP-Link 703N? This, ladies and gentlemen, is a router. Bless you. It has an Ethernet port, which I can connect to there. It has a USB port to which I can connect a GSM 3G modem and connect to this device from anywhere on the planet. And it has wireless interface. So even if I don't like the GSM option, I can just cross the street and turn this into an access point, raising your local area network to a wireless network. Now, the problem with this one is that it requires um, power through USB. Of course, that's not a problem because there is an open uh, wall port right there, right? But, once again, this guy has a big brother. This one has a five-hour battery. And guess what? It's white. This is a medical facility. It fits. All I have to do is brand it. Medical clinic, do not touch. It can stay there forever. <laughs> this is a hospital in Tel Aviv. They have two wireless networks. One is for patients, and that's free. The other one is strongly encrypted, and it's for medical staff. This is where they access your medical records, track your medication, whatever. But what good is a strongly encrypted wireless network if all you have to do is disconnect the access point from the wall port and connect one of these bodies. This is direct access to the one biggest secret of the hospital. And I know that everyone likes to think about information theft, and yes, it is very embarrassing for a hospital to discover that their medical records have been stolen, and this just happened last month in the US. But there are worse things that a lot of people forget. Data integrity. What happens if I change your blood type? Next time you get an infusion, you die. What happens if I change your medication? Oh, you're allergic to uh, penicillin? Sorry, my bad. Or even better, let's say that your prime minister or president or whichever you like the least goes to get a CT scan. They type their, their name into the computer. All I have to do is ambush. And then when they sit inside the machine, just crank up the radiation. No one will know anything. Two months later, election. <laughs> this is an ATM at a shopping mall. Just in case you were not sure, it'll tell you. This is the ATM. <laughs> and like you've already heard, ATMs are nothing more than machines running Windows XP, which is not supported anymore. And I want to give you a few local examples, because when I travel the world and I give these examples, everybody's like, yeah, but that's Israel. You guys are criminals. <laughs> I've been traveling Australia and uh, New Zealand for a month now. And I have to tell you guys, I love this place, really. But you're too trusting, which for me is, a, of course, a good thing. This is a restaurant right here in Melbourne, a good one, actually. This is outside the venue, and they have a point of sale device on that table. And if you look under the table, that's that wall port. Same problem here in Australia. A hotel lobby here in Melbourne. Is Guy in the, is here, Guy? No, no, no. So I was having a meeting with this guy here, who happens to be called Guy, and this is a point of sale device at the lobby. Look at the wires. Now, how are they protecting the sensitive um, and, uh, Ethernet connection? With wood. <laughs> so I have Ethernet, I have power, I can use the little buddy, and it'll stay there forever. No one will ever find out, right? This is a coffee place in Brisbane. Same problem. I actually talked to the owner. I showed her the presentation. And she tells me, yeah, we, we had a point of sale device outside, but it's training now, so we took that off. Well, it'll probably come back out in the summer. And I said, did you disconnect it from the switch? And she said, no, why would we? This is the point of sale device that they're using. Okay? It's the same one as in the restaurant, I think. In Brisbane, you can go visit City Hall on weekends. Of course, they lock all the doors, but you can wander around. 
This is an unattended desk. It has an IP phone. The IP phone is connected to a wall port. In many organizations, the voice over IP runs on the corporate network. They're not using segregated networks. These things are riddled with vulnerabilities. The phones, the CCMs, just read about it, Google it, all right? Have you guys heard of JFGI? That's the number one search tool, just freaking Google it. Now, in case you were wondering whether this was an important office or just a cloakroom, this is where it is. Now, I don't know if Lord is his first name or last, <laughs> but apparently he's the mayor, okay? A couple of weeks ago, I attended an event in Queensland organized by the Queensland police, and it was a three-day event, and on the, the, the first evening, there was a celebratory dinner uh, at a theme park that all their sponsors pay for. Don't worry, it wasn't your tax money. And on my way back from the bathroom, the toilets, the loo, you pick your word, I found an ATM, which is reasonable given the location. Now, I was aiming low. I was like, okay, let's see if there's another wall port there so I can take a photo, because I was giving the presentation the following morning. Guess what I found? Someone left the ATM in maintenance mode. Can you guys read what it says there? Cash dispenser diagnostics? Yes, sir, uh, how many bills and from which cassette would you like? This, of course, is about money, but if you go through the menu options, you can learn all about the device, the setup, the network setup, password. I can come back later. This was at night, so there was actually no money in there. But if I copy the password, I can come back later and just go in. Or God knows what else I can do. And Canberra, nice city. But when you go there on the weekends, it's basically you and the birds. <laughs> if you go visit many birds, by the way, beautiful ones. If you go to... Uh, the parliament, you can also walk around. Now, these are the metal detector gates, right? So uh, a little anecdote, I went with another uh, employee, Dan, and we went through, of course I beep, I always beep, and they scanned me and they cleared me. And then I said, well guys, I wanna show you something. Some of these gates use differential metering. It's not how much metal is inside, but how much more metal than the last sample. And right in front of their eyes, I just slowly walked through the device, and I was not detected. And they, they freaked out. And Dan was like, ah, don't worry. He does this for a living. <laughs> this is actually the second floor. This one was unattended. And right next to it, this. Now, of course, in the parliament building in Australia, when my business trip is not finished yet, I don't connect to the wall. But I could, okay? So, moving on. My dad was not feeling well, went to the hospital. Of course, we all go visit him. And I find this. When you're, when you're in the hospital, you're a captive audience. You can't go anywhere, so why not take your money? You have this device that'll let you watch TV, listen to music, and watch video on demand. And you can browse the internet if you want. And it has a touch screen. This is a, an all-in-one PC. It has a credit card reader, which of course attracts my attention, and earphones, just so you don't wake up the guy in the bed next to you. But it also has a USB port in the back, and two more in the bottom. So I tell my dad, uh, well, I will definitely be coming back tomorrow. <laughs> and I did. And I came back with what is now an integral part of my toolkit. It's right there in my bag at the sound station, a USB keyboard. I connect the USB keyboard and NumLock works, so I know the machine is recognizing this as a keyboard, but nothing else does. So they blocked it, and I try Windows stuff, and I try Linux stuff, and I can't escape the interface. Now, what do you do when your computer hangs on you? What's the last thing you can do? You unplug it from the wall, right? That's the power plug. Unplug, replug, F11, like crazy. And buy a setup. No password. Um, when you can access that, you can pretty much do whatever you want. And of course, the, as an attacker, what I will want to do is boot into something else, because I want to be the administrator. 
Now, which is the operating system of choice for this situation? Backtrack, now known as Kali. These are old photos. This is a free operating system for penetration testers. It has every known tool to man that is free. You can take over the world with what they have on that ESO that you can download and put in a USB drive. And you don't even need a license for that, OK? So I'm trying to connect to the network, and I realize that even though I can see that the computer is configured to get an IP from the network, I'm not getting one. Now, I don't care about one computer. That's not interesting. I want access to the network, particularly because this is a hospital. So I start looking through the configuration files, because their operating system is also Linux. And in Linux, everything is in text files. And to my amazement, I discovered that they are actually encrypting their wired network, 802.1x. And I was like, wow. I have never seen that actually used. No one uses that. So for 30 whole seconds, they had my respect. <laughs> and the reason that it was only 30 seconds was because like everything else in Linux, the credentials are also in a text file just next to it. OK, so all I had to do was copy these two files, turn the interface off, turn it back on, and I now have an IP address on the encrypted network and I'm running as an administrator on my own machine. So this is where the fun starts. We start with what you do for a disclosure document. We, we uh, look out, look where we are, and do a proof of concept of a reverse shell. That's like leaving a tool on the machine to allow us to connect to it from the outside world. Because it's always under an, uh, behind a NAT, I can't directly access it. But if it accesses me, then we can open a shell. This is called a reverse shell. And you can see here, me opening netcat on port 53, which, by the way, no one blocks at all. Port 53 is the DNS port in UDP. No one blocks that. And this is my colleague back at Checkpoint headquarters uh, looking at the network configuration files. Further analysis of the evidence that we're collecting leads us to this link. And of course, in my job, what you do is trial and error. You try stuff. Hmm, what is that? Oh, let's test this. Let's check this. Let's look into that. And this, apparently, is the actual user interface. That's the thing you saw in the beginning. Now, unlike in the beginning, where it was a full screen, you can see that this is my browser in my operating system. And unlike before, I can now control the URL. So if it says client, it can say something else. For example, admin. These are the web server files. And later, we got the credentials for the server. Now, this hospital has 3,500 beds. All these beds have these, uh, these devices. They all browse onto the same web page. If I put a vulnerable web page there, or vulnerability, on that web page, I can instantly create a 3,500 bot net immediately. So I can you know, use it for DDoSing, for uh, spamming, I can steal credit card numbers, anything I want, OK? My dad got better, and we lost access to the device, which under the circumstances was OK, acceptable, I should say. But then, once we were about to complete the report and go for disclosure, we discovered that other hospitals are using the exact same device, which means that now we're just waiting for someone to get sick so we can finish the research. So if you guys are in the hospital, give me a call. <laughs> Summing this one up, the purpose of the device was a smart TV for hospital patients. What we actually achieved, network encryption keys and possible access to other networks. We just didn't have enough time. But if their internet traffic goes through the hospital, the possibilities are endless. Now, what did we use for this hack? a free operating system, a USB drive, a USB keyboard, and a USB mouse. You don't need an expert license for that. You can do whatever you want with that. I have it in my bag. Half of you probably have half of it in your bags. Easy. Now, in February, I was flying to present this, what you've seen so far, in a conference in the Dominican Republic. So I was flying through New York. Terminal 5, JFK, I made it to the gate. 40 minutes ahead of the boarding, I got bored. You do not want me bored. That is not good. 
These devices are used for selling you stuff. Right before you go on the plane, you can order food and, and products from stores inside the terminal, and they will rush it to you before you board the plane. So of course, I tried to uh, um, escape the interface. This is also a touch screen. Nothing works. And then I remember, wait, I forgot the basics. Let's look under the machine. All in one PC, all ports exposed. So now I have a keyboard in my back, right? It's part of my toolkit. And I discovered that I'm the administrator on the Windows XP. And I find 74 more devices like that on the network. And they're all created from the same image. They all look exactly the same. And I have an IP address, and I can access the internet. And I scan the network to see how many barriers I have between me and the outside world, because this is inside an airport. Theoretically, if they're not using their own internet infrastructure, they could be going through the airport, right? When I look at the installed applications, I see that they're using Ultra VNC. So someone is using that to connect to these devices from a remote location and administer them, or administrate them, whatever. I don't know how, how, you, how you say that. And they have a rc4.key file. That's nice. They use a strong encryption, not just a password that you can enumerate on. But I'm the administrator. I can take that with me. 128-bit key is now in my possession. And even the Cisco router gives you little bits and pieces of information that on their own mean nothing. But when you've gotten as far as I have, it all increases your, uh, your visibility. It all draws little more piece, small little pieces of the puzzle. So the purpose of the device was to basically give you some entertainment and offer you to buy stuff. What I got from it was uh, VNC encryption keys, possible access to other networks. I don't know. I didn't have enough time. I had to board the plane, and a, pot a potential botnet. All I have to do is just copy the credit card numbers and use them over time. What sophisticated hacking tool did I use for this attack? These two. And you know what? Here's something for you. I didn't actually use the USB drive. I only used the keyboard. The reason I had to use the USB drive was because as I was taking photos with my camera, the quality was shitty. And I said, hey, I'm the administrator. Why just not take screenshots? <laughs> so I was doing this for you guys, basically. And this is why I had to use the USB drive for better quality. So conclusion, local networks are rarely as monitored and as protected as the inter internet gateway. Everybody is expecting the threats to come out from the internet. So this is where they concentrate their attention. But how many of you actually monitor internal traffic? How many of you have segregated networks in such a manner that you can answer a simple question like, how would I know if someone at HR is trying to access source code? Would I detect that? And if I don't have any detection for it, do I have the ability to uh, make that question or that query and answer it? Was it, did that happen yesterday or any time in the last year? Many devices that are publicly accessible do not get hardened against unauthorized access. This is the ABC, guys. The documents have been written ages ago. Disable USB ports. If a wall port is not connected to a device, disconnect it from the switch. I don't want to go over that. It's, Basic stuff. And compromising a device on an internal network is a big step in a lateral movement operation. I can go wherever I want, and you wouldn't even know. And it'll be a lot harder for you to do an incident response and actually figure out how, to, how I pull that off. So the best practice is basically ask yourself, would I trust Inbar here? If I came to visit, would you leave me alone? Now, most of the people by now say no, but that's a good question. It's funny, but it's a, good, it's a good example. Think about that, right? So it's not all about cyber, OK? We must not forget the physical security. Now, if at this point you're still thinking, yeah, you know, he's a little weird. Only he does this stuff. Well, here's something for you. If the uh, company president quotes you, you must be onto something, OK? And that was pretty much the third sentence that Amnon said. This is how important this is. People completely neglect that. 
and the, it could uh, lead to catastrophic results, okay? So sorry for the scare, but take a look. Thank you. <laughs>